verse 25 and verse number 26. And as you turn in there, I, I was not joking what I said uh, about not knowing that pledge by heart all the way. Uh, I can't tell you how many Saturdays I'm sitting in my living room typing up the slideshow that I have to look at Tucker and Noah and say, say the pledge to me real fast. And so I type it as they write it. And uh, so I praise God for kids that have memorized it a lot better than I have. But uh, John chapter 11, verse number 25 and verse number 26. Verse number 25 and verse number 26. Jesus said to her, to Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die ever. Do you believe this? <coughs> Father God, we love you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for what we've already experienced this morning. And now we come to uh, what I love, uh, God, what I believe is the most precious time of, of any believer's life when we get to feast on your word. May this time bring glory to you. May you search our hearts, the intents of our minds, the intents of our hearts that today we might, God, be convicted of sin we might lose all sense of doubt and just truly learn to live in your glory and grace. It's in the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated at this time. Coming today to John 11 and the story that many of you love and probably have read many times. Miss Kay sings about it all the time when she sings the song when he's four days late, he's still on time. In John 11, we come to the story of Lazarus, the story of Lazarus. And today I'm going to bring you a message entitled this, Eternal Life, Do You Believe This? Eternal Life, Do You Believe This? Because right there in verse 11, or chapter 11, verse 25 and 26, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, he will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die, ever. Do you believe this? I believe those two verses of Scripture are the, the focal point of chapter number 11. Now, just last week, we talked extensively on the topic of the assurance of your salvation. How can you know that you know that you know that you are truly a born-again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's my prayer that when you walked out of the door last week, that maybe for the very first time in your life, you might have walked out of here with some sense of assurance of your salvation. Maybe you walked out not having any doubts anymore over the salvation that you possess. Or maybe last week you walked out of here for the very first time in your life saved and knowing that you're saved. And I pray that over the last week as you have pondered on the words from last Sunday that you have not doubted your salvation anymore because you've realized that since He alone is responsible for your salvation that you can, you can know today that your, your salvation is secure. And so we talked a lot last week of the doubts that we face. The doubts that we face with our salvation. You know, there's another doubt that can creep into our minds. <coughs> And it's this doubt over eternal life. Is there really something beyond the grave? Or is this life and its realities all that there is? And so we better have all the fun we can have now because once we die, it's over. Eternal life. We hear it said all the time. Whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting die life. But do we believe, truly believe, that there is something that awaits us on the other side of death? As a pastor, I stand on a monthly basis over, <laughs> over caskets of people who have passed away. And the one hope that everyone always clings to is that just maybe I will be able to see my loved one again on the other side of death. I 
I'll tell the family they live today. You can see them again if you believe in Jesus. And in that moment of death, we all cling to this hope that, that yes, I, I can see my loved one again. And many people who were in the congregation that day, or on those days, they'll cling to that hope that one day I can see them again. But as they leave and years go by, a lot of times they forget about that hope. They forget about that person. And before long, they no longer have this expectation of seeing them again. So how can you know today that eternal life is real? How can you know, Brother Tommy, that there is actually something beyond the grave? It's interesting as you read the Bible, as you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke never mention eternal life. They mention the kingdom of God. But then you get to John and he mentions over and over and over again eternal life for the believer. As a matter of fact, there's a central character in the book of John named Jesus. We all know Jesus because we come to worship him today. He's the central figure in the book of John. But there's a central theme in the book of John and that theme is eternal life for the believer. As a matter of fact, at the very end of the book of John, John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31, John says these words, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book, but these, speaking of everything he's wrote, written from John 1 to John 20, but these are written so that you may believe in Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, and by believing you may have life in his name, eternal life. Do you believe this? That those who believe in Jesus, who trust in him, will never die, ever. Do you really believe that there's something beyond the grave? Do you believe this? It's the question that I want you to ponder in your heart this morning. Because I want, to, I want to show you this morning how you can know for certain that eternal life is a reality that awaits the believer. I want to show you this morning how you can know for certain that eternal life is a reality that awaits the believer. Now there are a few truths that I want to show you from John chapter number 11 this morning. And they all speak to that, that one that, that, that one foundational statement, how you can know for certain that eternal life is a reality that awaits the believer. Number one, know this. We can know that eternal life is certain because Jesus is a very personal Savior. We can know that eternal life is certain because Jesus is a very personal Savior. Now look with me, if you will, at John chapter 11, verse 1 through 3. Now a man was sick, Lazarus from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair. And it was her brother Lazarus who was sick. So the sister sent a message to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Now did you notice in those first three verses that John gives us the names of those involved in the story. John says, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. John giving us the names of the characters in John 11 is not consistent with his pattern of writing throughout the first 10 chapters of his gospel. So what do you mean by that? Well, in the first 10 chapters of his gospel, aside from Nicodemus, Everyone who Jesus personally comes in contact with, are, they're, they're unnamed. John chapter 4, he goes to Samaria, and he meets a woman at the well. He tells her everything about her life, Daddy. Everything she's doing even at that current moment, but she's unnamed. John chapter 5, he comes to the pool of Bethesda. He finds a man who has been there laying by the pool for 38 years. He tells him to pick up his mat and to walk. The man gets up and walks and worships Jesus. He's unnamed. John chapter 6. 
The feeding of the 5,000. There's a little lad who brings his sack lunch to Jesus. And that little sack lunch, the two fish and the five loaves, that little sack lunch feeds 5,000 men, probably upwards of 20,000 people. But that little lad, his name is never known. John 8, the woman uh, who is caught in adultery, who Jesus does not condemn. Her name is not known. John 9, the blind man, his name is not known. Throughout the Gospel of John, he never gives us the names of those uh, who, who Jesus comes in contact with, ministers to, and heals. But when he comes to John 11, he's very specific in letting us know who these three people are. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Now, why would John suddenly deviate from the way that he has written the entire gospel to give us these three people's names. Well, there's really three reasons that you could take uh, this morning and, and, and apply to the text. Number one would be this. John never mentions the names of any of those people because throughout the book of John, John always just wants to esteem Jesus. He wants to lift Jesus high above all the rest. It's not important to know the names of those who were healed. Instead, it's Important to know the one who healed him. So it's not important to know who the blind man was. It's important to know Jesus. And so all along, John lifts up Jesus. But here in this story, John 11, it's possible that John writes her name because he's saying, look, this story is so magnificent and this miracle is so great that it doesn't matter if you know their names because no matter how you take it, you will always esteem Jesus because he's the one who brought the man back from the dead. That's one reason. Number two would be this, uh, that... Uh, that, that Jesus, or that John in this story, uh, is, is actually mentioning their names because they were still alive at the time he wrote the book. And so the time he writes his gospel, Lazarus, Martha, and Mary are all still alive. And John's saying, look, if you don't believe my account, go to Bethany. Go to the village they live and ask them. They will confirm to you that the testimony I'm giving you is absolutely true. You can go ask Lazarus about what happened in his life. You can go ask Martha. You can go ask Mary. But the third explanation, and it's the one I want you to remember, is this. John included their names because at the moment Jesus came to Bethany that day, they were already believers in him. Before he came, they had already put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. All the others... The woman at the well, the man at the pool, the little lad, uh, the woman of John 8, John 9, the blind man, all the others were unconverted at the moment that Jesus came to them. And when he heals them or speaks to them, they become saved later. And so in John 11, however, it's almost certain that Lazarus, Martha, and Mary were already in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. How do we know that? Read the first three verses again. The man was sick, Lazarus from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the oil, or the Lord, with the fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair. It was her brother Lazarus who was sick. Remember that story of Mary anointing the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ with her hair in a, in a, in a moment of worship. But now, chronologically, that actually happens two chapters later in John. So actually, John is... It's not even mentioned that story yet, but he said, if you want to know who this involved, it's the woman who wiped his feet with his hair. But we know that Luke tells us that Jesus had already had an encounter with his family. Martha and Mary, Jesus makes his way to their home. And Martha is serving Jesus. But Mary, what? She finds herself at his feet and is listening to him and worshiping him. Of course, Martha gets angry. It's not that Martha was doing anything bad in serving, just Mary was doing something greater. She was worshiping Jesus. And so at the moment that Jesus comes here to Bethany, these folks were already believers in him. They were already in a relationship with him. It's important for you to note that. Especially when we talk about eternal life and Jesus being a personal Savior. Why is that important to note when thinking of eternal life? Well, go with me, if you will, to Revelation chapter number 21. Revelation 21. We're going to take a little journey real quick. Revelation 21. Just follow along. Revelation 21. And here, John, who's the writer of the Gospel of John, is also the writer of the book of Revelation. 
John, at the end of 21, chapter 21, he has seen a vision of the new Jerusalem that comes down out of heaven. He says there in verse 10 of 21, he then carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, arrayed with God's glory. So John is seeing a vision of the future uh, heaven, the future Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem that awaits the believers in Christ. And so keep that in mind as you read verse 22 through verse number 27. John says, I did not see a sanctuary in it, speaking of this heavenly city, because the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its sanctuary. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it because God's glory illuminates it and its lamp is the lamp. The nations will walk in its light and the kings of earth will bring their glory into it. Each day its gates will close. Uh, Its gates will never close because it will never be night there. They will bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. Now watch verse 27. Nothing profane will ever enter it. No one who does what is vile or false, but only those written in the Lamb's book of life. Only those names who are recorded in the Lamb's book of life will be allowed into this eternal celestial city where God the Father and the Lamb are the center and the radiance of it. When you were born again, friends, your name was written in his book. It is said if you're a believer in Christ, whether or not that's true, I don't know, but I believe it just, I think it sounds good. It is said that your name has been written in the ink of his blood. And his name, and, and, and there is no erasing your name out of that book. To the believer in Jesus, know this. Your name is etched in heaven for all eternity. The Lamb's book of life. Now keep that in mind and turn back with me to Matthew chapter number 7. Matthew chapter 7. And look with me, if you will, at verse 21 through verse number 23. Matthew 7, verse 21 through verse number 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and do many miracles in your name? Then I will answer them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. So here, here is the reason they are judged. They knew and sent to eternity in hell. They knew Jesus, but Jesus did not know them. Let me tell you why that's important. I love Billy Graham. He's a great evangelist. We all know who Billy Graham is. We know his name. Today I can go get a biography about Billy Graham. I can read about Billy Graham. I can know everything there is to know about Dr. Graham. I can know the color of his hair. I can know the color of his eyes. Donald, I can know how tall he is. I can know what size shoe he wears. I can know his wife's name, his kid's name, everything there is to know about Billy Graham. And I can look at you, Chris, and I can say, I know Billy Graham. Because I know everything about him. I know him. There's one problem. Billy Graham doesn't know me. Friends, the same goes with Jesus. You can know all there is to know about Jesus from his word, from Sunday school, from different programs, vacation Bible school, singing songs. You can know everything you need to know about Jesus. But if he does not know you, you will spend eternity in a place called hell. How do we know that's true? It's substantiated in the book of Luke, chapter 16. Turn with me. Luke, chapter 16. Substantiated here. Luke 16, starting in verse number 19. Luke 16, verse number 19. Notice what the Bible says here. You've got to pick up on this. There was a rich man 
a rich man, unnamed rich man. There was a rich man who would dress in purple and fine linen, feasting lavishly every day. But a poor man named Lazarus. The rich man is unnamed, the poor man is named. His name is Lazarus, just like the Lazarus in this story. He was covered with sores and he was left at his gate. He longed to be filled with what fell from the rich man's table. But instead the dogs would come and lick his sores. One day the poor man, Lazarus, died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man, unnamed, also died and was buried. And being in torment in Hades, he looked up and saw Abraham a long way off with Lazarus at his side. Do you notice something here? The rich man is unnamed, and the rich man spends eternity in hell. We never know his name. Lazarus, however, the poor man, we know his name, and where does he spend eternity? He spends eternity in a place called heaven. Why is that important? Because he did not know the name of the rich man. Why? He never knew him. Friends, to those of you who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, he is a very personal Savior. So personal that if you are one of his followers, he even knows your name. Kaylee, he knows your name. Alex, he knows your name. The other day, I was sitting at the supper table, and I got Tucker and Noah there. My name is Zachary R. Williams. I asked Tucker and Noah, what is my middle name? And Tucker said, Zachary Reverend Williams. <laughs> and I said, no, that's not my middle name. My middle name's Robert. And I asked Noah, I said, what's my middle name? And he said, Robert. R-O-V-E-R. I said, Robert, that's not even a name. Not even my kids know my name. But God knows my name. Amen. He's a very personal Savior. John 10, verse 27. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. When he came to John chapter number 11, friends, he knew Martha. He knew Mary. He knew Lazarus. Verse 3, Lord, the one you love is sick. Verse 5, now Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. Why? They had already put their faith in him. He knew them by name. He knew when Martha hurt. He knew when Mary wept. He already was aware of the sickness that Lazarus was going through when they came and told him, Lord, the one you love is sick. Why? Because he is a very personal Savior. Friends, if he knows you today, understand the same is true in your life. He knows everything about you. Hebrews 4, 15. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize who was unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tested in every way as we are yet without sin. Isn't that the beauty of Jesus? That when I go through temptation today, my Savior has been through the same temptation. When I grieve over a lost loved one, Jesus also grieved in his life. When I celebrate a spiritual mountain, Jesus also experienced the top of the mountain. When I go through storms in my life, he also went through storms in his life. He's a very personal Savior. He understands, Miss Gay, what it means to go through sickness, to go through pain, to go through life. A very personal Savior. He knows you to your core. He's close to you. If you're a believer in Jesus. You know exactly what I'm saying. And you know the beauty of that old song. I come to the garden alone. While the dew is still on the roses. And the voice I hear falling on my ear. The Son of God discloses. And He walks with me. And He talks with me. And he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Jesus is a very personal Savior. 
You can know that your eternal life is certain because He knows you. Your name has been written down in heaven, etched in heaven. And it will be there for all of eternity. And when you pass and He sees you standing there, He will not have to say, depart, for I never knew you. He will say, Kaylee, welcome. Welcome to heaven, thou good and faithful servant. Isn't that good news? He's a very personal Savior. We can know eternal life is possible or certain because He is a personal Savior. Secondly, eternal life is certain because Jesus has proven himself powerful over death. Jesus has proven himself powerful over death. Or as you see there on your screens, Jesus has conquered death. I spoke a moment ago of those caskets that I stand over and, and speak words of encouragement to families. Friends, I want you to know something. If the Lord Jesus tarries and does not come back within 100 years, everyone in this room will be dead. 100 years from now, we will all be gone. Death. Death. Since Genesis chapter number 3, everyone who has ever lived has died. Except two people, Elijah and Enoch, from the Bible. They were both literally raptured out into heaven without tasting death. Other than those two men, every person who has ever lived has died. 100%. I can tell you 100% today, if, you, if the Lord Jesus does not come back anytime soon, you will die. It's a fact of life. All of us will die. Some of you will die sooner than others. Look around. You can tell. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Some of you, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Some of y'all looked at a big lot. Some of you will die sooner than others. In all reality, if you really want to just be honest, you, you look around the room, you see somebody say, man, you know, that person's close to death, but really aren't we all close to death? Yeah. I mean, we're just, we're just one, one blink of an eye away from stepping off into eternity. You can actually say that death is the gateway into eternal life. For one cannot enter eternity unless they first pass through the gates of death. Now Jesus, being the sovereign God of the universe, was not secluded from the pains of death in his life. By the time we come to John 11, two people that were very close to Jesus have died. One would be Joseph, his earthly father. You say, how do you know Joseph had died? Well, the last time we have any record of Joseph, Joseph is when Jesus was 12 years old at the temple. And after that, in his whole, uh, whole ministry of those three and a half years from the time he's 30 to 33, it mentions his mother, it mentions his brothers, but it never mentions his earthly father. The thought is that Joseph had already died by that time. Another close companion had already died as well, Daddy. That would be John the Baptist. John the Baptist had been beheaded by Herod because he called out his sin. I tell you that to tell you this. Jesus knew death. He knew the grief associated with death. He knew the pain associated with death. We see this evident in John chapter number 11. Just, just, we're going to just look at this these verses of Scripture. Just follow along with me this morning. Because I want to show you how, how eternal life is certain because Jesus has conquered death. You get there to verse 4. It says, or to verse 3. Lord, the one you love is sick. Verse number 4. Jesus heard it and he said, this sickness will not end in death. But it's for the glory of God, so the Son of God may be glorified through it. Remember John 9? In John 9, isn't this the same thing that he said? Lord, who sinned this man or his parents that he was born blind? Neither. This came about so that God's works might be displayed in him. When Jesus came to the blind man, he knew that he was going to open the blind man's eyes. That people might glorify him as the Messiah and Savior of the world and put their faith in him. Jesus here in John 11 and verse 4. 
This will not end in death. It's for the glory of God. So the Son of God may be glorified through it. Why does he say that? Go back up to chapter 10, verse 37. Chapter 10, verse 37. Jesus says, If I'm not doing my Father's works, don't believe me. But if I'm doing them and you don't believe me, believe the works. This way you will know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. Jesus in John 11 is about to do a work so great that no man can deny that he's the Son of God. Why? Because only God is the giver of life. If he can give life to a dead man, then it would almost be certain that he is truly the Son of God. Verse 5. Now Jesus loved Martha, her sister, and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place that he was. Then after that, he said to the disciples, let's go to Judea again. Verse number 8, Rabbi, the disciples told him, just now the Jews tried to stone you and you're going there again. Verse 31, chapter 10, the Bible says again the Jews picked up rocks to stone him. And so in John 10, when he said he was the good shepherd, Truly setting himself up as God the Father, God, or not as God the Father, but God the Son, the creator of it all, as the God of the universe. I'm the Father of one. They wanted to kill him for blasphemy. They wanted to stone him. So Jesus, the Bible tells us in verse number 40, he departed, chapter 10, he departed across to the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing earlier, he remained there. So they left from the danger, but now he's going back to the very place where they wanted to kill him. His disciples say, are you really going to go back? I mean, these people want to kill you. And after all, you say you're going to be the, you're the Messiah of the world, and the Messiah isn't supposed to die. He's supposed to reign and rule in righteousness on the throne of Jerusalem. So you're going to go back with a death wish so they may kill you? Jesus says, aren't there 12 hours in a day? Anyone who walks during the day, he doesn't stumble, but... Because he sees the light of this world. If anyone walks during the night, he does stumble because the light is not in him. He said this. And then he told them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. But I'm on my way to wake him up. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he'll get well. Jesus, however, was speaking about his death. But they were speaking about natural sleep. So Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. I'm glad for you that I wasn't there so that you may believe. But let's go to him. Why did Jesus say Lazarus has fallen asleep? Because, friends, listen, a believer in Christ never dies. You simply close your eyes on this side, but you awake immediately on the other side. Yes, this old body may pass away, but friends, you have a soul that goes on for all of eternity. And so Jesus says, Lazarus has simply fallen asleep. He said, died? Verse number 16, then Thomas called twin, the one who would eventually actually doubt him, said to his fellow disciples, let's go so we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Why is that important? Well, if you go over uh, to John 11, Verse number 39, Jesus says, remove the stone. And Martha, the dead man's sister, told him, Lord, he's already been decaying. It's been four days. He's already been decaying. Literally, Lord, he already stinks. Death has set in. It has been four days. That's also important because in Jewish belief, the spirit or the soul is believed to rest with the individual for three days. On the fourth day, the soul was said to go on. So for three days, someone could possibly maybe not be dead. They could rise again. But on the fourth day, it was absolutely certain that they were dead. Lord, it's been four days. Four days, the Bible says. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. Verse 19, many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them about their brother. As soon as Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary remained seated in the house. And Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Yet even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. What faith, right? Yeah, what faith. But, but, listen, Martha in that moment was not asking Jesus to raise her brother from the dead. She had no clue what Jesus was about to do. All she was stating there is this, Lord, if you would have been here, he wouldn't have died. But even now, Lord, I want you to know, as bad as it is right now, you're still good. 
and I still believe in you. Isn't that amazing that as bad as life can get, the believer can say, but you're still good. You're still good. Jesus says your brother will rise again. And then in verse 24, Martha says, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Really, Jesus is speaking to her Jewish belief. The Jewish belief was that people would die, and then when the Messiah would reign, the dead would rise up, and they would reign with him. But it was not an immediate transference into the kingdom of God upon death. They had to lay and wait at some time, and the righteous would one day rise up. And so Jesus said, your brother will rise again. She had no way of knowing in that moment what Jesus was about to do. She thought he was speaking of the resurrection of the last day. When the righteous dead Jews would rise up to reign with the Messiah. This is what she's thinking. It's a totally Jewish expectation. But Jesus says, verse 25, listen, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die ever. Do you believe this? Now, friends, I want to tell you something. Those are some pretty big words if you can't back it up. Now, go back with me to, Mark, to, to John 5 quickly. John 5. Listen to these words of Jesus. Tell me this don't sound eerily similar to what he's just said. John 5, verse 21. And just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so the Son also gives life to anyone he wants to. Now go down to verse 24. I assure you, anyone who hears my word and believes him who has sent me has eternal life and will not come under judgment but has passed from death to life. I assure you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, so he's also granted to the Son to have life in himself. And he has granted him the right to pass judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this, because the time is coming when all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good things to the resurrection of life, but done, those who have done wicked things to the resurrection of judgment. Once again, these are big words to say. So how can we know that these words of Jesus are true? That he really has the authority to give us life after the grave. I want to hearken your minds back to Mark chapter 2. You want to turn there. I'll just tell you the story. Mark 2, there's a man who is paralyzed. And Jesus is in Peter's house. And he's teaching and healing. And the Bible says that everyone was crowded at the door, wanting in to be healed. And these four friends, they have a man who is paralyzed. And they're desperate to get him to Jesus. And so they carry him up onto the roof of Peter's house. And they knock a hole in the roof. And they lower him down to the feet of Jesus. And Jesus looks at the crippled man, Danny, and he says these words, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And internally the Pharisees say these words, Who can forgive sins but God alone? And then Mark 2 says, Jesus perceiving in himself what they were thinking, says these words, Which is easier, to say to him, Your sins are forgiven you, or to tell him to pick up his mat and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins, I say to you, pick up your mat and walk. And the man gets up and he walks out the door. Jesus gave that miracle to prove that his words on forgiving sins were true. That when I say I can forgive sins, you can trust it because, look, I can do this to prove it. And so here in John 11, this whole focal point is around 25 and 26. I'm the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will, even if he dies, will live. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die ever. Do you believe this? And so for him to say that, he better be able to back it up. 
He better be able to do something to prove to you, Shannon, and to me, and to everyone who sits in every funeral in every church across the world today. He better do something to prove to us that, yes, I can really give you eternal life. I can back up what I say. That life is in me, and I give it to whom I want. Verse 27, yes, Lord, you told him, I believe you're the Messiah, the Son of God, who comes into the world. What a confession, a beautiful confession. Do you believe the same? Having said this, she went back and she called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and is calling for you. As soon as she heard this, she got up quickly, she went to him. Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw that Mary got up quickly and went out. So they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to cry there. When Mary came to Jesus, where, where Jesus was, and saw him, she fell on his feet and told him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. The same thing Martha said. And so both of these women, they were waiting on a miracle. While Jesus was in some foreign place, they were waiting on a miracle. And if he would just come, he could heal it. They knew that Jesus was the only one that could do that. Now watch verse 33. When Jesus saw her crying, and the Jews who had come with her crying, he was angry in his spirit. What was Jesus angry at? Was he angry at Mary for weeping? Was he angry at Martha for being upset? Was he angry at the Jews who had come to, as professional mourners to mourn at the tomb? Who was he, what was he angry at? He was angry. He was angry at death. Now listen to what I'm going to say to you. He was angry at death. Why was he angry at death? Because death is the consequence of what? Sin. And friends, God is always angry at sin. And so although Lazarus may have died not because of some personal sin that he had committed... It was sin that had put him in the grave. The wage of sin is death. You will die one day because you what? Are a sinner. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all die because of sin. And Jesus at the tomb and the Bible says he is angry. He's angry at death. He's angry at the sin that put Lazarus in the tomb. He's angry over it. Angry to the point where he's deeply moved. What's the Bible say? He's deeply moved. And he asked in verse 34, where have you put him, he asked. Lord, they told him, come and see. In verse 35, beautiful verse. Danny asked me this question this morning. What's the shortest verse in the Bible? It's right there, verse 35, two words, Jesus wept. Once again, that goes back to what we said at the beginning. Jesus is a very personal Savior. He wept at the tomb of Lazarus. Why? Because he loved him. They even say in the next verse, the Jews said, see how he loved him. Some of them said, couldn't he who opened the blind man's eyes also have kept him from dying? And then Jesus, angry at himself again, he came to the tomb. This anger that he feels here, back in Mark chapter number 7, there's a man who is deaf, born deaf. And the Bible says that Jesus puts his thumbs on his uh, on, on his tongue and he puts his fingers in his ears and he looks to heaven and he sighs deeply. He cries out, Ephatha! And immediately the deaf man's ears are open. That sigh is the same anger, the same word for anger that we feel he, here, here. Jesus was angry at the sin that caused the, the, the deformity of the man in Mark 7. He's angry at the sin that caused the death of Lazarus here in chapter number 11 of the book of John. He's angry over it. Martha, the dead man's sister, told him, Lord, he's already, been, he's already decayed. He's been here four days. Jesus said to her, didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? And so he removed the stone. And then Jesus raised his eyes. And he said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I know that you always hear me. But because of the crowd standing here, I said this so they may believe that you sent me. And after he said this, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! Shouted with a loud voice. The actual phrase in the Greek is megaphone. 
He literally, just like a megaphone, he shouted, Lazarus, come forth. The words in the, in the Hebrew that he used or the Greek that he used was Lazarus, Duro, Exo. Lazarus, Duro, Exo. And the Bible says the dead man came out bound hand and foot with the linen strips and with his face wrapped in cloth. And Jesus said, loose him and let him go. Bobby, when you have talked about this often, that the old saying is, if Jesus had not have said, Lazarus, come forth. If he had just said, come forth, every person in every grave there that day would have come out. I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me, though he die, yet he will live. You better be able to back it up, Jesus. And at the tomb of Lazarus, he backed it up. He proved to everybody standing there that day that he was powerful over death. Listen to me, friend. Death has no authority over God. Who is this man standing before you in John 11 that is so powerful that even death submits to his voice? That even death obeys what he says? Lazarus, come forth. Can you imagine the scene, Brother Head, that must have played out that day? As the, st as the stone has been moved and Jesus says the word and stumbling out of that old grave comes a man wrapped up in linen cloth and alive. The man who just a moment ago stunk because he had been there for four days now comes out smelling like a newborn baby alive and well, no longer sick. Jesus proved in that moment that he is powerful over death. Friends, you can know your eternal life is certain because Jesus has conquered even death. Death has no authority over you because of who he is and what he's done. It's proven in John 11. Lazarus came forth. Amen. Understand today, if you're a believer in Jesus, death is not final. Not at all. The moment of death, you immediately pass into the arms of Jesus. How do I know? It's because Jesus proved it by resurrecting, raising Lazarus from the head. He proved that John 11, 25, and 26 is absolutely, unequivocally true. The one who believes in me, though he dies, yet he will live. And the one who believes in me will never die, ever. Do you believe this? He's just proven to you that he has a power over death. Lastly, today you can know that eternal life is certain because Jesus lives. And then one day, I'll cross that river. I'll fight life's final war with pain. And then as death gives way to victory, I'll see the lights of glory and I'll know he lives. We can know eternal life is certain because Jesus lives. Now back in Luke 16, there's a story of the rich man and Lazarus. And from hell, the rich man cries out and he says, just send Lazarus with just a drip of water to put it on my tongue because I'm in agony in this flame. God speaks and he says, no. Lazarus can't pass to you. You can't pass him. There's a great chasm that's been fixed. And the rich man from hell, he says these words. He says, well, just send somebody to tell my brothers. Send somebody to tell my brothers. And then God answers again and says, no. They have the law and they have the prophets. They have the scriptures. The law and the prophets. And then he says this. Even if a man were raised from the dead, they still would not believe. And who had died but a man named Lazarus. And now just a few weeks later, he honestly, literally brings a man named Lazarus back from the dead. And do they believe? No. What do they do? They kill him. They go after Lazarus to kill him, and then ultimately what do they do? They kill Jesus. Go to John chapter 18. John chapter number 18. Starting 
verse number 39 or 38. After he said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no grounds for charging him. You have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at Passover. So do you want me to re release to you the king of the Jews? They shout about, no, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was revolutionary. By the way, Barabbas, the actual name means son of God. And so literally standing before them that, that day was Barabbas, son of God, Jesus, the son of God. And they had to make a choice, which one they want. And who did they choose? They chose Barabbas, <coughs> son of God, who's representative of everybody in this room, instead of the son of God. Then Pilate took Jesus, had him flogged, the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns, put it on his head and threw a purple robe around him. And they repeatedly came up to him and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And were slapping his face. Pilate went outside again and said to them, Look, I'm bringing him outside to you to let you know that I find no grounds for charging him. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests in the temple saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! Pilate responded, Take him and crucify him yourself, for I find no grounds for charging him. We have a law, the Jews replied, and according to the law, he must die, because he made himself the son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was more afraid than ever. He went back into the headquarters and asked Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus did not give him an answer. So Pilate said to him, you're not talking to me. Don't you know that I have authority to release you, the authority to crucify you? You would, not have, you would have no authority over me at all if it had not been given you from above. This is why the one who handed me over to you is, has the greater sin, Jesus answered. From that moment forward, Pilate made every effort to release him, but the Jews shouted, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Anyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside. He sat down on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. It was the preparation day for the Passover. It was about six in the morning. Then he told the Jews, Here is your king. They shouted, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said to them, should I crucify your king? We have no king but Caesar. The chief priest answered, so then, because of them, he handed him over to be crucified. Therefore they took Jesus away, carrying his own cross. He went out to what is called the skull place, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had a sign lettered and put on the cross. The inscription was, Jesus the Nazarene, king of the Jews. Which actually, if you go and look at the, the actual letters that were put on the actual plaque above Jesus' head, it spelled Yahweh Jehovah. <laughs> Pilate had no clue what he had done, but he had put the name Jehovah on the cross, saying to the Jews, you have crucified your God. Many of the Jews read this sign because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. It was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priest and the Jews said to Pilate, don't write the king of the Jews. But then he said, I'm the king of the Jews. Pilate replied, what I've written, I've written. Then the soldiers crucified Jesus. They took his clothes and divided them into four parts, a part for each soldier. They also took the tunic, which is seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who gets it. They did this to fulfill the scripture that says they divided my clothes among themselves and they cast lots for my clothing. And this is what the soldiers did. Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved standing there, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. From that hour the disciple took her into his home. After this, when Jesus knew everything was now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I'm thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was sitting there, so he fixed a sponge full of sour wine and hyssop and held it up to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. Sin atoned for. Sacrifice. The ultimate sacrifice had been paid. God's wrath had been poured out on the sin of the world, on the shoulders of his son, and now sin had been paid for. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Since it was preparation day, the Jews did not want the bodies to remain on the cross on the Sabbath. But that Sabbath was a special day. They requested that Pilate have the, man's leg, the men's legs broken and their bodies be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man and broke the legs uh, of who had been crucified with Jesus. When they came to Jesus, they did not break his legs since they saw he was already dead. He is dead. <coughs> no doubt about it. He was not in a coma. 
He, he was not just sick, he was dead. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this is testified so that you also may believe. His testimony is true. He knows he's telling the truth. John was there. He saw it with his own eyes. For these things ha- happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. No one broke his, no one, not one of his balls will be broken. Also another scripture says they will look at the one they pierced. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because of fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might remove Jesus' body. Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took his body away. Nicodemus, who had previously came to him at night, also come, came bringing a mixture of about 75 pounds of myrrh and aloes. Then they took Jesus' body and wrapped it in linen cloths with aramaic spices, according to the burial custom of the Jews. There was a garden in the place where he was crucified. A new tomb was in the garden. No one had yet been placed in it. They placed Jesus there because of the Jewish preparation day since the tomb was nearby. Jesus is dead. He's lying in a cold tomb alone. Dead. The worst days of the disciples' life are now upon them. The one they loved, the Messiah they expected to reign on the the throne in Jerusalem, is now dead. And on the first day of the week, the Bible says, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. She saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran to Simon Peter and to the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. Put him at that. Peter and the other disciple went out, heading for the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and got to the tomb first. Stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. Then, following him, Simon Peter came also. He entered the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there. The wrapping that had been on his head was not lying with the linen cloths, but was folded up in a separate place by itself. The other disciple who had reached the tomb first, then entered the tomb, saw and believed. For they still did not understand the description that said he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went home again. But Mary stood outside facing the tomb, crying. As she was crying, she stooped to look into the tomb. She saw two angels in white sitting there, one at the head, one at the feet, where Jesus' body had been laying. They said to her, Woman, why are you crying? Because they've taken away my Lord, she told him, told them. So I don't know where they've put it. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, though she did not know it was Jesus. Woman, Jesus said to her, Why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Supposing he was the gardener, she replied, Sir, if you've removed him, tell me where you put him, and I will take him away. Jesus said, Mary. Turning around, she said to him in Hebrew, Rabbani, which means teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus told her, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and tell them that I'm ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them what he had said to her. In the evening of that first day of the week, the disciples were gathered together and the doors were locked. Because of the fear of the Jews. The time came when Jesus stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. Having said this, he showed them his hands and his side. So the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. After saying this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But one of the twelve, Thomas, called twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples kept telling him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, if I don't see the mark of nails in his hand, put my finger in the mark of nails and put my hand in his side, I will never believe. And after eight days, the disciples were indoor again, and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and observe my hands. Reach out. Uh, your hand and put it in my side. Don't be an unbeliever, but a believer. Thomas responded, my Lord and my God. Jesus said, because you have seen me, you have believed. Those who believe without seeing are blessed. And that's when John writes, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book, but these are written so you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and by believing you may have life in his name. Jesus was dead, but he rose again. He rose from the dead. But he did not go and die again. Lazarus was resurrected, but one day he died again. Jesus did not go and die again. No, go to Acts chapter number 1. In Acts chapter number 1, what's the Bible say? Acts chapter 1, verse number 9. After he had said these things, he was taken up. As they were watching, and a cloud took him out of their sight. 
While he was going, they were gazing into he heaven, and suddenly two men in white close to by, they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken away from you, will come in the same way that you have seen him going up into heaven. Jesus, he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and the Bible lets us know that when he ascended into heaven, he passed into the Holy of Holies in heaven, not made by human hands, but made by the hands of God himself. And when he walked into that great tabernacle, the Holy of Holies in heaven, he sat down at the right hand of the Father. And friends, today in heaven, there is a human being named Jesus who is God from the eternal foundations of the world sitting on the throne and he is coming back and you can know that your eternal life is certain because he died, he conquered death, he rose from the dead he sits in heaven today he is alive know it's certain because he lives just say there in Hebrews 4, it says, We have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to the confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tested in every way as we are, yet without sin. And then he says, Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace at the proper time. He lives today, interceding for the saints, awaiting that moment when God the Father says, go and get my own. And one day, if you die before he comes back, friends, you will stand before him. And if you are a believer in Christ, he will say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into my kingdom that has been prepared for you beforehand for eternal glory. But if you do not believe in him, friends, he will say, depart from me, I never knew you. For those of you in the room who have come to the throne of grace a moment in your life and begged for mercy, I promise you this, you received mercy. If you have put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, you have passed from death unto life. You have been made alive with the Messiah even though you were dead, dead in trespasses and sins. You have been saved by grace. And today you can know for certain that eternal life is your future. You will spend eternity in heaven with Jesus. You do not have to doubt. You can know that the moment of death you will step from this life into the next life. You do not have to doubt your eternity. But I just wonder this morning if there's someone in the room who like Lazarus who was dead physically, you're dead spiritually. And Jesus is saying, come forth out of the graves, come forth out of your spiritual deadness, deadness and put your faith in me so that you may live. I wonder if there's someone today that Jesus is calling your name to come out from the graves and to put your faith in him that you may have eternal life. Eternal life. Do you believe this? That those who believe in Jesus will live forever. And that those who don't will be punished forever. I'll close by saying this. If you say you believe that eternal life is certain, then why don't you live like it is? Eternal life for the believer begins the moment of salvation. If you believe eternity is true, why don't you live today like it is? If eternity is true, then friends, there are people on the outside of these walls that will die without Jesus and spend eternity separated from him. Eternal life is certain. Eternal hell is certain as well. We have been given eternal life as a gift from Jesus. And we will spend eternity with him. Let's spend today all of our efforts making sure that those on the outside of these doors know that eternal life is a reality that can be obtained by those who believe. Amen? Amen. Let's go to the Lord and pray.